Get your lungs ready. Seems like every day you just feel like Jesus is getting closer to coming back. So we're going to have a praise fest one day and be non stop singing and worshiping, right? Yeah. 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 Just remember who's on the throne today. Amen. Uh, he is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that He is Lord. Amen. He is King. He is Lord. He is, and he loves us, by the way. Turn to someone and say, God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. Yeah, so we're talking about um, we're talking about grace for all. We love the grace that God gives us, right? We love the grace that God gives to us. Uh, but we're talking about grace for all. And um, last week we started uh, the series by asking, um, like looking at the that God asks us to do hard things. Have you ever, did you kind of think about this week that, that God asks us to do hard things um, in our lives, right? If it was easy, everybody would be doing it, right? So there are challenges that we face as Christians, you know? Um, so we face hard things, everybody with me on that? Kind of like, have you faced a hard thing recently that God's asked you to do? And, and you're, you're going like, man, I don't know if I want to do this or not. Anybody with me? We realize that God asks us to do hard things not so that we can um, struggle or, or fail or, or for God to sit back and laugh at us, but, but God asks us to do the hard things because He knows that those hard things are going to work for our benefit, for our good, and for His honor and for, our glo and for His glory in the end. That's the reason why Romans 8.28 says, and we know that God causes everything. Isn't that amazing? God causes everything in your life to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purposes for them. So God does ask us to do hard things, right? Right? If it was easy, everybody would be doing it, right? And, and then we found out last night that we're learning what it means to love all people. Uh, especially ones we call around here, they're called e, EGRs, right? Extra grace required. <laughs> We're called to love all people. Even the ones that are difficult to love. Most of you wives are thinking about your husbands right now. <laughs> I don't know. I, I just chose that for my wife. So don't think I'm pointing any fingers this yeah, yeah. But at CCN, we, 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 we're, you know, we're asking God to help us each week to, to know what it looks like to, 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 to love our neighbor as, you know, we love ourselves. We want to continue to create around CCN a culture and, and a community. By the way, culture and community doesn't happen because someone decides that, hey, we're going to say this happens. A culture and a community happens because we choose to be a part of God's vessel and be used. And we want to create a culture and community of love around here, right? We really, and, and that's going to take work, right? It really does. It's not something that just happens. And, and you know, we can, we can have a lot of, we can put, we, we can put, hey, we, we love God and we love others. But what good of it is it if we're not really loving God and loving others, right? We want to have a culture, a, 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 a community of love. We want that to be de developed, but not only talked about, but we want to see it lived out. Like, stand up, Nikki. Show them your shirt this morning. We want everybody to wear this shirt. Yeah, we're planning on taking orders starting next week. Yeah, because we're going to be showing up more and more in our community. And we want people to know that we love God and we love others. Yep. But we're not just going to wear the t-shirt, right? Because right. mm -hmm. it's easy to wear a t-shirt. Anybody got a t-shirt kind of like that? <laughs> it's easy to wear the t-shirt. It's harder to live the t-shirt. Yes. Amen? Yes. Last week we talked about it. We've been in Jonah chapter 1. We talked about how Jonah bought a one-way ticket to Tarshish. Um, he, was, he was supposed to go, I believe, to, to Nineveh. But he chose to go to Tarshish, okay? Have you ever been there before where you, you know God wants you to go one direction, but you go to other direction, you know, God wanted you. So, and, and then he finds himself, because he chose to disobey God, he finds himself in the midst of a storm. Jonah, we know in this story, he is not acting out in love. He, it's all about his self-interest. It really is. It's all about, it's about Jonah. And so just because, by the way, just because Jonah ran from God doesn't mean that God changed his plans, by the way. Remember that. 
Just because you run from God or, or try a different direction, it doesn't mean that God's going to change his plans. As you know, we, we believe Ephesians 2.10 that says, For we are his workmanship, that we're created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared in advance for us to walk in. So just because we choose to rebel, it doesn't mean that those plans aren't still needing to be fulfilled. We learned that, that we all have opportunities. Everyone, and I hope you saw that this week, that we all have opportunities each and every day to love and to serve the people that are around us, even when it's hard. Because grace is always needed. Turn to someone this morning and say, grace is always, always needed. It really is. It is. And we, as Christ ambassadors, we need to be conduits of God's grace. Amen? Amen. So we're going to pick up now uh, in verse 70 where we left off the story of Jonah. And we're going to talk today about how we can extend grace, that we can, how we can be conduits of grace to others because, God's, because of God's grace in our lives. And that, that's, that's a big thing. We are to extend grace and we're to extend forgiveness to others in the same way that God has extended to, to us. And guess what? How that is. It's unconditionally. I, I, I read this quote. It didn't actually have someone's name on it. It says, grace always shocks. Grace always stuns. Grace is always what we need. It's what everyone groping around lost in the dark has to know. Turn toward grace and you turn on all the lights. That's powerful, isn't it? And, and we, we want to not only be a community of love, but we, wanna, we, wanna, we really want to be a grace community. That, that theme has really been in my heart, you know, grace community. What does it look like to be that, that grace community? And, and the reason why we want to extend grace, right, so graciously is because God has shown so much grace to us. Anybody with me today? Yeah. Yeah. Anybody with me? Have you, have you been the recipient of God's grace? Yeah. Have you ever thought about yeah. why God gives you that grace? Yeah. Uh, so when I needed God's grace, I'm so glad that God didn't withhold it. Even today, when I need God's grace, I'm glad that God doesn't withhold that from me. So it doesn't matter where you've been, what you've done, where you've been. God doesn't withhold things from you. I, I, I see this in the story of Jonah. Jonah received the grace of God not because he was good. Jonah received the grace of, because God is good. And that was his nature to give good things. But also we see this, that Jonah was God's child. And every good and perfect gift comes from the law. He gives us those good things. So grace, by the way, when we talked about grace, we also try to put parameters on it, you know. We try to, we try to define it, but grace is, is messy. It really is. Grace is, is complicated. And sometimes it's a hard word <clears throat> to understand when we think about it. And, and it's, it's a hard word to experience. Philip, Philip Yancey says this, that grace is this free gift of God. He gives us this free gift, but to receive a gift, you must have open hands. So if I do this with you, let's, let's put our hands out right today. Open our hands. Open them up. And receive God's grace. Yes. I don't know where you've been. I don't know what's going on in your life today. You know what it is. And God today is wanting to extend this grace. Amen. Give God a praise offering this morning. Amen. Yes. Yes. Think about this. If God's grace and mercy is bigger than your failures. God's grace and mercy is bigger than your sins, your hurts, your habits, your hang-ups. God's grace is bigger than your mess-ups. It's a lot, isn't it? Grace is God's overwhelming desire, by the way, to treat you as if you've never sinned. God's grace can write you a new beginning. That's the reason why 2 Corinthians 5.17 says that all the old is gone and all things become new because you are a new creation in Christ. Amen? Amen. And every time, I don't know about you, but every time I've messed up, every time I've been disobedient, God didn't extend me grace because I was good. He extended me grace because I was His. Amen? Amen. 
Because God's grace is, by the way, it's inexhaustible. It's inexhaustible. You may feel like that you're in a place where like God can't, but He can. And He does. And if you want to receive that grace, you just got to open up your hands. Because grace is not dependent upon you. It's dependent upon who God is. I love Ephesians 1.5. five says, God decided in advance to adopt us into His own family by bringing us to Himself through Jesus Christ. Amen. We are in His family. This is what He wanted to do. And it gave him great pleasure. So the story that we're continuing to look at, it's a story, it's a message of Jonah, is a message of outrageous grace. Outrageous grace isn't a favor. By the way, you can't earn this outrageous grace by doing good things or being good. It's a gift you receive by being God's. I want you to know that. That's so important. It's a gift that you receive by being God's. Remember, we went through the Trinity, and we talked about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we talked about the perfectness of the Father towards His people, His children. And we've got to remember that today. For by grace you've been saved. You've been saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So grace is going to always be about God. God is a generous Father, and He extends this generous grace to everyone today. Everyone. So we're going to pick up the story of, about this outrageous grace. We're going to be in chapter 1, verses 1, 17. And then we're going to work from there on out, okay? So when you think of grace, we don't really think of grace and difficulties together. But yes, they do go together. Grace and difficulties do go together. And, and we're going to see that one being played out. We're going to see the grace of God that happens in verse 17 of chapter 1 of Jonah. When, and the Lord appointed, by the way, turn to someone and say appointed. Appointed. Appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So, no matter, no matter how far we run, God's grace is for us. Whoa. No matter how far we run, God's grace is for us. And that is not just for the body of believers. That is for the world. You have to believe today of God's provenient grace. You have to believe that God is drawing on. He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw on. We have to believe that even the people that we struggle with today, that God is drawing them. He's calling them. He's not giving up on them. No matter how far we run, God's grace is for us. At first, when we, when we look, at, look at Jonah, it looks like he's willingly allowing himself to be thrown overboard. And, and it makes him look like a selfless hero, but he's not. He is still running. When Jonah chose to be thrown overboard right now, it was a selfish thing he did. Jonah being thrown overboard was like him fleeing to Tarshish. When he was running towards Tarshish, this was an act of rebellion, running away from God's call on his life. So Jonah had once again chosen himself. Have you ever done that before? Have you ever chosen yourself over God's plan? Have you ever chosen yourself? And so, Je so since he made that choice, Jonah finds himself in need of something. He needs salvation. Literally, Jonah is in the, the perils of the ocean. I had one experience. We were in San Diego, and it was when I was a youth pastor. And I had this one experience where we were at, out in the ocean. That, when I was a youth pastor, I used to play in the ocean. <laughs> and then for some reason, when I became an adult, I didn't like sand anymore. But there was one point when we were doing something, I never had felt that undertow before. And I was in a place in that, I don't know why, but there was some this, this undertow. And I don't know what was happening, but literally it was pulling me under. It was pulling me out. See, I've never experienced that before. As you know, I'm right here today. <laughs> Somehow I got away from that. But that's what exactly, I mean, this is what's happening with Jonah. I mean, literally, he is, is sinking because he chose to flee God's plan and purpose for his life. So God then 
He appoints. God literally sent, by the way. Turn to someone and say, God sent. God sent. Anybody got any appointments this week? Yes. All right, we all got appointments, right? Listen, we got to go to God sent this giant fish to swallow Jonah and save him from certain disaster, by the way. Now, it would have been nice if they sent him a carnival cruise liner, right? <laughs> but he sinks. He's going deeper and deeper. It reminds me of Proverbs 16, 9. We can, plan, make, we can make our plans, but really the Lord determines our steps. And so when we look here, we see, we see Jonah sinking, and God sends this whale, this, this giant fish to swallow him. And we realize that God's discipline of Jonah was an act of grace and mercy. And it still amazes me that this, this guy was swallowed by this huge fish. And wasn't immediately just chomped up. And then destroyed by what was inside that giant fish. See, God in his mercy appointed, he sent this great fish to swallow him and keep him safe within his belly. And for three days and three nights, that's where he is. So God disciplines of Jonah was an act of grace and mercy. There's a reason behind God's grace and discipline. And when you go through God's grace and discipline, remember, he doesn't do that to hurt you. He does that to help you. His discipline is purposeful. It's not purposeless. So if you've ever loved God and you've ever strayed, you need to understand that God's discipline is purposeful. And the reason why that he was disciplined him is said, you're not to go to Tarshish. My plan's for Nineveh. So God's discipline of Jonah was an act of grace and mercy. God's discipline of Jonah was an act of love. Those of you that are parents, you know what I'm talking about. You've been there with me. We've had to do the hard thing as parents for our children because we love them, right? We've had to do the hard things. We've had to make the hard calls. We've had to say the hard things. See, God's God's discipline of Jonah was an act of love. So if you find yourself running in the wrong direction and God is disciplining you, know that you're his child. Because if Jonah wasn't God's, he would just let him run. He would let him do his own thing. He would let him destroy his life. But Jonah was disciplined because God loved him and Jonah was God's. In Lamentations 3, 22 and 23, it says, through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed. That word consumed is so powerful. The only reason why we're standing on our feet today as a nation is because of the Lord's kindness and the goodness of him. Amen. Don't say that God can't consume our nation because he can and he will someday. He is, we, are, we are living in a day of grace, but there is a day coming of judgment. Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed because his compassion fail not. Now see, when I was a parent, I lost compassion at times. Anybody with me? No, you guys are all perfect parents. I forgot that. You're all perfect. But there were times when I lost that idea of being compassionate. Moms and dads, remember that God has given us the picture of how we are to live yes. over our families. Since God's mercies don't consume us, His compassion fail not, they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Yes. So important. Then it goes on in, in verse 32. It says, though He causes grief, by the way, He causes grief. He causes grief. He causes grief. Man, we get convicted and he causes grief. He causes grief. Think about that. Yet, he will show compassion according to the multitude of his mercy. So, just by appointing, by sending this, this fish to swallow Jonah... God was acting in grace. God was acting in love. And really, if Jonah had never had that, that 
situation, he would never realize or recognize his need to be rescued. He would never realize if he wasn't rescued that he needed to be rescued. And it was in that fish that Jonah realized this, that God was his only hope. God was his only hope. Scripture says from inside this fish, Jonah began to pray a prayer. By the way, doesn't that happen in our lives? It was inside the fish that Jonah began to pray this, this very big, passionate prayer. Don't wait till you're in a fish, by the way. <laughs> right? This is what we do, you know? We need to learn to not wait for something to swallow us. We need to develop a prayer life. We need to be with God. So that when we go and we will go through difficulties, we will be ready to stand in those situations. But it was inside this fish that, 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 uh, that Jonah prayed one of his, his, probably one of his deepest prayers. And we've all been there, haven't we? Oh God, I need you. Anybody with me? I've tried everything. I've done everything. I've run in every direction. Oh God, I need you. Just five simple words. It says in verse 1, Then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God from the belly of the fish. Verse 2 says, saying, I called out. I called out to the Lord. Use your mouth, people. I called out to the Lord. He called out of my distress, and he answered me. Know today that God is not deaf. He hears you when you talk with him. Amen. It says, out of the belly of Sheol, I cried, and you heard my voice. Verse 3, for you, circle that word, for you. God knew that it was more dangerous for Jonah to be in Tarshish. And he said, for you, God, for you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas. Oh, I may have thought I jumped over the edge, but it was you who cast me into the deep, into the heart of the sea, and the flood surrounded me. Oh, all your ways. All your ways and your billows because you're the creator of the heavens and earth. all of your waves and all of your billows everything was passing over me then I said I'm driven away from your side do you see how lost he feels I don't see you God are you here are you around Yet, he says, no matter what happens here, that whatever happens in the belly, I shall again look upon your holy temple. Jonah was aware of his own need for rescue. The question for us this morning is, how many times have we been in that situation? How many times have we been that person who's run from God or, or ignored God and, and we realize that we need saving. I mean, we can look and, and we can look at the prophet Jonah and we can find all sorts of reasons to be critical. We can even look at the state of the church today and, and we can be critical. But think, I think today when we begin to look at Jonah, it's a, it's a chance for us to begin to look at our own hearts and, and look at the the rebellion that sometimes lies within us and the possibilities of sin. How many times, by the way, could we have been prompted from the Spirit to listen to someone, to stop rushing, and yet we choose not to listen. We just choose to stay busy. How many times have we felt led to pray for someone? Maybe we talk ourselves out of it. How many times have we had a flutter in our chest and there's this specific need and that we could help, but yet we choose to not follow through. See, I think when we look at this story, it illustrates the selfish nature of Jonah, but it also can reveal a lot about us. In 
and it's a reminder of why we need to be his hands and feet. In James 4, 17, it's a powerful scripture. It says, therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. That strikes a hard note, doesn't it? But God saved Jonah despite his running and his continued obedience, disobedience. God gave Jonah grace, and he gave that grace not based on performance, but because Jonah was his child. Today, he shows us grace and mercy. Today, that's what he extends to us. And we're so open up our hands. Let's open up our hands again and let's receive today the kindness of God today towards us. Let's realize that just as Jonah was given a second chance and a third chance and a fourth chance, that that's the God who loves us. That's the God who lives and wants to give us the same thing. There is no dead end here, by the way. There is no dead end. This is the God that loves us today. And he's the God of first and, and second and third and fourth chances. And, and we see that. We see the kindness that God shows Jonah. And it's the same kindness that he shows us today. So let's jump in now back into verse 5. Um, and we'll see how Jonah responds to the grace of God. It says, the waters closed in over me. This is a very dark picture. The waters are literally come. They're going to take my life. The deep surrounds me. I mean, he is by himself in the belly of a well. The deep surround. It's got to be dark. Weeds, by the way. This stuff that the, the well. Weeds were, were wrapped around about my head. And at the roots of the mountains, he says, I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. This is a description of a guy who is at the bottom. But God does some of his best work when we're at the bottom. Amen. I'm telling you, what you see as a hopeless cause is not. Because God does some of his best work when we are at the bottom. And this, I mean, Jonah is at the bottom. He's as far as he can go. And the gates were slamming shut behind him forever. Yet. That word yet. The story doesn't end here. Aren't you glad for that? I don't know about your life, but I can write my, I can write my story today. And you go, oh, and I would go, yet. Right? Yet. I love that. Yet. You. It was God who brought up my life from the pit. Oh, Lord, my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came to you and to your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I vow I will pay Salvation, by the way, here he goes. He says, salvation belongs to the Lord. Amen. See, if we can't receive God's grace for ourselves, we won't be able to extend it for, to others. See, that's part of, you know, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, Right? So if, if we don't really receive God's forgiveness, we're not going to be able to give God's forgiveness out. And it's the same thing with grace. I don't know where you've been, because the enemy's plan is to remind you, by the way, of your past. So he's, he's, he loves to steal, kill, and destroy. He really does. So I don't, I don't know where you've been, but that's the great opponent to grace, is that we remember, instead of remembering what God did, we remember our past. So if we're, if we're not able to receive God's forgiveness and truly live in that forgiveness, we're not going to be able to let someone off the hook. We're not going to be able to forgive people. Truly, that's how it begins, is me receiving God's forgiveness. When I remember how great of a debt I owe, how big of a sinner I am, and that God forgives me, and I remember that, I can, I can forgive others. And Jonah right now, he was in a, he was in a losing battle. And he really needed to receive God's grace. And until we can really receive God's grace, we can't extend that to others. Have you received God's grace today? 
Have you allowed God's grace to just wash over you in every situation? Because that's exactly what God is extending to us today. So in his prayer to God, Jonah was desperate and realized God was the only one who could save him. He's at the bottom. Most of the stories, even in my own personal family, I, I, could, bring, I could bring nephew after nephew up here. And they would tell me that they would tell you the same story now standing in their faith that they were at the bottom. They were in jail or they were in prison or they were had an addiction. There was something that they would tell you that they were at the bottom, and it was at the bottom that God met them. Because God never gives up, and God never gives in. Jonah finally understands that he needs God's rescue, and that salvation belongs to to the Lord. But even in the midst of all of this, even in the midst of all this, it's interesting that Jonah really doesn't really repent. He doesn't really repent here, by the way. You know what Jonah is thankful for at this point? He's thankful that God has saved him. And as we look at this story, we'll realize that Jonah didn't repent. He just he was just thankful. He was thankful that for all the grace that God was going to give him, but he still didn't want to give it to other people. He came out a reluctant prophet. Think about that. He was stubborn. He was thankful. He didn't die. But Jonah, if you look at that, he really never, like, you know when David, you know when he was caught up, and he says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew all right, Spirit, cast me out from your presence, Lord. You know, the pra a prayer of repentance that he had? Jonah says, thank you, God. I still don't think they deserve your grace and mercy, but thank you for showing it to me because I deserve it. That, that is really the way, I mean, he literally, he doesn't apologize for ignoring God's command. In 2 Corinthians 7, 10 says this, For the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads us away from sin and results in salvation. There's no regret for that kind of sorrow, but worldly sorrow, but worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, results in spiritual death. And so in grace, the Lord vomits Jonah out upon the dry land. The fish literally spits him out. So this right now, this was Jonah's chance. Right here, wrapped in seaweed and ooh, gooey stuff all over him. Probably really like white and looking and dead. Here it, here it is Jonah's chance to respond correctly to God's initial command. But think about this in closing. Our prayers can say a lot about us. How many times have we prayed and prayed, God, just save me? But sometimes our prayers can lack repentance. That God doesn't want us just to confess our sins. Because he's faithful and just to forgive them. We love that part, right? But he says, repent. Right. Repent. Turn the way. Turn the opposite way. See, if we allow God to move in our hearts, his rescue leads us to repentance. I think this biggest setback in the church today, and I'm going to say it in my own life, in our nation is this lack of repentance. You prayed it before. If my people who humble themselves and pray and seek thy face, we don't think we need God. We don't act like we need God. I think right now, between now and our election, we as a people should be praying. Not for a president, but for repentance. That we haven't been a praying nation. That we haven't been a praying. That I'm not trying to say, I'm not trying to guilt anybody today. 
But all of the grace that God has shown us through all of our lives, and we're here today, and we shouldn't be. There's some of us, I should not be here today. There's some of us that can say, yeah, I know what you're talking about. We shouldn't be here today yet. Yet. Do you like that word, yet? God's grace has been extended to our lives. And we should also remember today, since God has given us this grace and we've received this grace, we need to extend it to those around. We are not here by accident in Coolidge, Arizona. We are not here by chance. God has a divine plan and a purpose. He wants to use us for his glory, to build his kingdom here on earth. And I'm excited that we get to be a part of this plan. Amen. Are you excited? So when it looks like the end of the story, by the way, uh, if our praise team can kind of work their way up here. When it looks like the end of the, of, for Jonah, God was not done. I love that. Anybody feel like it was the end? God was not done. He is the God of second and third and fourth and fifth chances because that's who he is. That's who he is. That's what God does because just because it looks like the end does not mean God is finished, by the way. Just because you think it looks like the end, God is not finished yet. Everybody say it with me. Yeah. Yet. Yeah. You're standing at a crossroad right now. Yet. All right? And God's given us a free will, so we get to choose some things here. Yet. Okay? Are we going to open our hands or are we going to receive the grace God has for us? Are we going to move towards God or are we going to move away from Him? Uh, Alistair Briggs said, Beck says this, Christianity is not about how to escape from the difficulties of life. We signed up for that, didn't we? If I become a Christian, I want to escape the difficulties of life. In this world, you will have troubles. I mean, Jesus is very upfront. Think about that. It's about how to face the difficulties of life. And the Lord spoke, by the way, verse 10 to, and it vomited Jonah upon the dragon. It is not a coincidence that Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. The three days in the ocean were very significant. When Jonah was thrown overboard, it looked like the end. Where could there possibly be hope? There was no plausible way out. Jonah was stuck inside of the stomach of a fish and felt like a tomb in the middle of the sea, in the middle of the storm. And then after three days and three nights, Jonah was spit onto dry land. He was rescued and given another chance. There was life even when it looked like Jonah was as good as dead. Yet. Let's not forget this morning that there was another prophet who was sent by God to rescue people. He also spent three days inside of a tomb and he was resurrected from the dead. See, all honor to God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. For it is His boundless mercy that has given us the privilege of being born again. Amen. So that we are now members of God's own family. Now we live in the hope. Amen. Jonah didn't have any hope. We live in the hope. Because we have a Savior who was resurrected from the dead. Everything turns on that today, by the way. You either believe it or you don't believe it. He was resurrected. We have hope of eternal life because Christ rose again from the dead. Jesus was crucified on the cross. He was placed in a tomb. The tomb was his burial. It was where they intended his body to stay. They were thinking that his body was going to decay there. It looked like the end. But Jesus rose from the dead. See... Jonah's second chance would be the hope for the Ninevites. Jesus' resurrection gave us hope of salvation. We know that the story's not over, amen? In God's mercy, he offers us a living hope in Christ. So life, life can be hard, right? I've been going through some hard things as your pastor. Life can be hard. 
What good is it to, to not be transparent, right? Life can be hard. It can be difficult. We can feel hopeless at times. We can, we can feel stuck. Why don't we just like open up our hands and go like, God, it's hard. I feel hopeless. I feel stuck. And why don't we receive God's grace in those areas? We might be at the end of our rope we, with no way out. We may have financial struggles, struggles or relational conflict or, or this crippling addiction or, or anxiety. On the outside, it may look as if all is lost, by the way. I've seen that before. Just like your friend, Tammy. Stage four cancer, right? Will you stand up and tell us what happened? What should happen? Today, you might be at the end of your rope. On the outside, it may look as all is lost. But with God, anything is possible. God is a God of second and third and fourth chances. Not just for Jonah, not just for the Israelites, but for us today. He has grace for all. We just have to open up our hands today. And we have to receive that grace over us. He always gives us an opportunity to repent today, by the way. If God is talking to you, repent. I mean, I was back here, I'm not like blubbering all over myself. Just repent. Repent. He is always giving us opportunities to be obedient. See, the same opportunity for repentance and redirection is available to everyone. I like this. In closing, I want you to think, and we're going to sing a song. God is always willing to give me another chance to live in obedience to Him. Think about that today. He's always willing. If you feel like that's not true, that's the liar, the enemy talking to you. God is always willing to give us another chance. Well, I don't deserve it. No, well, none of us do it. Right. The second thing is feel this. I need God's grace every single day. I need God's grace every single day. Without God's willingness to offer it, we would be without hope. And do this. Ask God for His forgiveness for the ways in which we have been disobedient. And then ask God to move us out. We gotta, we, we gotta remember today in closing that it's always God's kindness. That leads us to repentance. Amen. And uh, we're gonna we're gonna sing that song. Uh, you are good in closing today. But we wanna we wanna open up our altars today, and we want you to feel free to come and pray, to write prayer request, write a, a, a like a card to God saying thank you for your goodness to me. Thank you for your kindness to me today. Matt, uh, Matt, can you just pray before we start singing? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, you are good. You are so good to us. Thank you for your grace and your mercy and all the great gifts you give to us that we might not even realize how many, how many gifts you give to us every day. Thank you for your patience and your mercy and your willingness to give us your love and just and have us as sons and daughters. And we just pray that you use us and that you lead us to true repentance, that you mold and conform our heart to walk in your ways. May you bless us in every way. I pray for good health and for uh, positivity and good thinking. May we um, hold our thoughts captive and, and align our will with your will, Father. 
we just pray for the blood of Jesus over our, our homes, over our children, over our lives. And we just pray that in every way you, you help us, uh, you mold us. We are the clay, you are the potter. And we just pray for your presence, for your spirit to fill up every, uh, every part of our being and permeate out for others to see. We are the light of the world. And we just pray that you help us uh, help us contain it, help us use it, help us uh, have self-control and, and live out the fruits of the Spirit. We just give you thanks, we give you praise, you are so good, in Jesus' name, amen. I just want to encourage you to, as we sing this morning, yeah, just stand. If you're struggling today, find a place to pray. If you come down and pray, you will be among the people who will join you today. Come and give God praise today. Give Him a right of praise today. This is about God today, not about us. God is our hope. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Open up your hands and receive the grace of God today. He's a good God. He loves you. Let that grace just wash over you today. Recognize that grace today. Thank you.
hope today um, that we see. And I hope today as a church we really understand our need for salvation. I pray that we understand that, that we truly need God. We need God in our churches. We need God in our communities. We need God in our nation. We need God in our world. We need God. And where there may be a world and there may be nations that say, we don't need God. We do need God. See, we need God in our families. We need God in our lives. We need God today. And he's literally standing at the door of the church saying, Behold, I stand at the door of God. And I don't know why I'm stuck here. But he says, If you open the door, I will come in. He's been knocking, knocking on the church's door. He's been knocking on our hearts, wanting to come into every situation. And we stand. And he won't do anything. He won't do anything until we open the door. The handle's on our side. He's not going to force his way in to your life, to your family, to our community, to our world. I'm praying for God to give us a heart for our community that we will be so humbled in prayer and fasting and love for God and truly believing that He can save. Because if we walk out of here this morning and not realize that if our neighbors don't find Jesus, they're going to hell. Bottom line. There are family members we know if they don't find Jesus, they won't be lost in eternity. There will be a day when, as Jonah says, the gates will shut. I'm not trying to scare us. But I'm praying for an awakening of our hearts. That something would drive us so much that the love that we have for God and the love we have for others will just drive us to do what Jesus did. And he said, I'm willing to die for the sins of the world. Will we be those people that will pick up our cross? But I think it begins all back into realizing our need for salvation and our need to share that with those that are around us. Amen. God, we give you praise. We pray for today for our church. We pray for the pastors of our communities, Lord. It is so easy, Lord, for us to get into our own holy huddles, Lord. It's so easy for us to come and even as a church and just be here, God. But you've called us, Lord, to be your ambassadors, Lord. You've called us, Lord, to, to go into those dark spaces, Lord. And it is so easy for us, Lord, even in our nation, to complain about other nations. And how bad they are. We know that all people are lost without you, God. We were lost without you, but you didn't call us to sit back and complain. You've asked us to go and be your vessels, Lord. So we ask for your help. May we be a praying people. May we be a people who truly believe in the power of prayer. That the God, that you do heal physically, you do heal spiritually, you do heal emotionally, God. You do heal, God. You are able to do exceedingly abundantly far more than we can ever ask or imagine, Lord. Now, as we've gathered, Lord, this morning, and you've extended so much grace to us, Lord, may we go out, Father, and share your amazing grace with others because that's what they're looking for, Father. They're looking for you, Jesus. They're looking for grace. They don't even know it, God. People are just running, God, yet you're just drawing on me to you. 
You're calling them Father. And I get excited, Lord, to think that this year, God, that our sanctuary, that the sanctuaries in our communities won't be filled not with people jumping from church to church, but with new believers, Father. People coming to know you, Father, as their Savior. Help us to be a part of your great commission to go, God, and make disciples. Lord, thank you for CCN. Thank you for this congregation. Thank you that I get to be their pastor, Lord. Thank you so much for what you've done, what you're going to do, Father. It's bigger than all of this, God. Because the word is yet today. Yet. I can't wait to see what you've got planned, Father, for our lives, for our church, for our families, for our community. We give you praise. We give you thanks. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. Don't forget the giving box is in the back. And uh, go out. Share the grace of God with those around you.